What's up, y'all? How you doing this morning? Welcome to another episode of BS Faith. My name is Lewis Dooley. And, man, I'm excited, Sam. Ask me why I'm excited. Why are you excited this morning? Man, this I'm ex- Wednesday. I'm excited because we got a guest today. Wait, is today the Ides of March? March 15th? I don't know. What is that? That's yeah. So you on that history stuff again. That's when... Uh, uh, Brutus killed Caesar. All right, we can talk about that later because I got to get this excitement Brute. about me, okay, man. Okay, go with it. Like, this person is a personal <laughs> friend of mine. Love her to death like she my own sister, although she is my sister in Christ, mm. um, a sister from a different mister, if you will. <laughs> but, man, it is such a joy and an honor and a blessing to have my sister, Junie Felix. Woo! Man, that is a round of applause. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. This is exciting for me, too. Well, man, I'm I'm excited even more that you're excited. So Junie Felix is here. And uh, if um, to describe her, she's a woman of prayer. Mm. And that's like that's foundational. Amen. For me. That's good that you said that first. Yep. Yeah. She's also an author, bestselling author of You're Worth the Work, Moving Forward from Trauma to faith there was another book too that i thought i saw of mine mm-hmm. yeah of yours was like a study like a four part study guide or something i thought i uh-huh. saw on google google don't lie by the way <laughs> yeah. in case y'all was wondering let, let me, uh, i started a series some years ago on prayer the gift of sorrow oh yes the gift of sorrow was actually the seed for you are worth okay. the work gift of sorrow guidebook towards renewed hope and healing from trauma that's right that looks fantastic oh thank you um so also you're a member of Dr. B.J. Fogg's Stanford Behavior Design Teaching Team, uh, author, speaker, radio and podcast host, and a C.S. Lewis Institute fellow. Now, did we have a certain C.S. Lewis Institute member here? We did. In this very studio. We did, in that very seat in that, that she's sitting seat. in. Yes, yeah. our executive director, K.J. Johnson. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. K.J. <laughs> was here. And I didn't, know that, I didn't know that you were involved in that. Oh, he was at my house on Monday. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Eating sushi with me. <laughs> wow. That's he and nice. his wife, Nydia. <laughs> okay. All right. So it also says in your spare time, you like to run. Yes. I love distance running. I'm a runner too. All right. And I run for my problems. Y'all tripping. <laughs> he said I run for my problems. No, I do. I, I actually, <laughs> sometimes I get out and I love running. Yeah. And I don't like running for like really the exercise of it. Like I could care less. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's, I just have to get out in God's creation. Yes. And just, I just love it. And hmm. so I find myself like on these long runs. Yes. It's almost, I, and, it's, a, and it's I'm, prayerful. It's very yeah. spiritual for me. And sometimes I'm like, what are you running from? <laughs> like, wow. Are you like doing something? Like, no, I'm enjoying God's creation and hmm. uh, I just love it. Oh, it's almost like you, you're reading my mind about what we're going to talk about today. That's one oh. of the things. Just get outside and enjoy the Lord. Yeah. Hmm. Be, be embodied. Mm-hmm. I'm more of a you. like in buildings type person myself, you know, unless I'm playing <laughs> sports outside. So I can't relate to y'all weirdos that like being in nature. Although I have started becoming fond of some of the grandness of God when I'm mm-hmm. near an yes. ocean or I'm mm-hmm. near mountains, like yeah. the Rocky Mountains. I'm like, whoa, like that's some serious stuff. It has a way of making you be your proper proportion of there, small. Exactly yeah, right. There's exactly. a whole yeah. study on it. It's the science yeah. of awe, A-W-E, huh. hmm. and what that does and how healthy that is for the human soul. Yeah. So, yeah, we wow. could talk about that all day. But, Shrinks yeah, I love distance running. Um, I, I like half marathons, but only a full marathon with best friends. Mm. Because after, like, mile 19, you just want to lay on the ground and die. Have, mm. have you done a full marathon? I have, yeah. But I've, I've done a lot of halves. I just, yeah. you know, I'll just grab a half on a weekend on a week. Halves are nothing. They're they're fun, yeah. By yourself with the right playlist. Well, I say that because I'll throw myself under the bus when it comes to the full marathon. <laughs> I've tried to do a full marathon uh, like three times. Oh, and I failed every time. Oh no, because I was with myself. Yes, you gotta oh, be with your I, best okay. friends. Yeah, I mm-hmm. get the mile like nineteen twenty. I'm it's fine. It's nineteen, and, and yeah. then and then all of a sudden <laughs> I just die. Interesting. But you talk about, like, you talk about running 13. No problem. I can go do that right now after pastries. It's like, but there's oh, something. Oh, I can't do it after pastries. No, I can't do that gluten. There's Mm-mm. something about that. I mean, it gets, wow. I just die after that it, mile. It reminds you that yeah. you are wonderfully made, yeah. though, no yeah. matter how far you make I'm it. I'm made yeah. differently then. I'm, I'm no less wonderful, but I'm differently made. That's right. There you go. Because I'm more like a mile and a half, maybe two mile type of dude That's on something. the treadmill, which I'll be doing yeah. later today. And you like sci-fi movies? Oh, yes. I'm a big sci-fi nerd. Star Wars, Marvel, those are the main two. 
Marvel what, a little less now. Star Wars is getting a little bit yeah. better. I'm giving them a lot of grace. We what forgave that, Disney. That movie, <laughs> Everything Everywhere, all at once. That's on the list. Going to see that very is soon. Is that considered sci fi? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It is a sci fi movie. It's weird. Movie. It's considered weird. Yeah. We talked about that last time. Well, it's exciting for me because it's Asian American and I my heritage on my mother's side is Japanese. Okay. So usually I just, I'm so blessed when I get to see representation yeah. of you know, part of my heritage. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. And you also like video games too. We can't leave that out. Oh yeah. We play every day, every night, every mm. member of my household. We, um, my husband and I met in the 10th grade. We were 15 years old and uh, we played video games then every day and we still play video games now. Wow. Every day. Favorite game right now. Okay. Right now we are working hard on Mario Kart 8 and Kirby mm. in the Forgotten Land. And uh, the third game we just picked up this week is the Mario Rabbits Part 2. So nice. we're usually playing three games, and we just kind of alternate days. Yeah. Wow, okay, okay. But I used my, to be more of a role player. Yeah, my favorite genre is RPG. But they haven't had any good ones that have mm-hmm. come out lately that we've been into, mostly the Final Fantasy series. What about, like, real RPGs? What like, do you mean, like, real RPGs? Like, like cosplay and like comic D&D, conventions? Like D&D. Yes. <laughs> no, no, no. My son plays. My Both my sons play. But, um, you know, we do comic conventions and things like that. We're a nerdy, geeky family. The works. That's I cool. think that's fantastic. That's cool. <laughs> People having ask, those things you, know, you do together is yeah. Well, it's it's really it's saved our marriage ten times Absolutely. to twenty times over because mm. people will say, "What's the key to a, you know a good marriage?" We've been together since we were fifteen. I'm like, yeah, yeah. prayer and video games. Yeah, yeah. that's us. Amen. Doing Praise the Lord. <laughs> In that order, prayer not, and video games. I'm not a video gamer, so that's. <laughs> I don't know what it's we do. Neither here nor it. there with it. It's a grace. I thank God for video games Absolutely. and sci-fi. Amen. It's cool. You say that kindness is a superpower. Oh, yeah. What do you mean by that? Oh, kindness is a superpower. I mean, come on, Galatians 5, it's listed in the fruit Mm. of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Kindness, goodness, goodness, faithfulness, faithfulness. you know, gentleness and self-control. Kindness is a superpower. And no matter how tiny, it has this amazing effect on people when it's sincere, Mm. when it's not anything but sincere. Yeah, yeah. It has a powerful effect. It can transform someone's day and it can be the tiniest thing that makes a difference. We in a, a episode a long time ago when it was just You're us thinking that we on the same yeah way. we had an episode about being nice. nice and nice is it we found opposite of true kindness because mm. niceness be. and the way that we talked about it, it comes from a Latin word nisiri which means to cover over or to hide. Mm. And so a lot of times we just play nice with people when we don't want to be real with them. That's Mm. right. But that's not what kindness is. Kindness, the root word is kin, Mm -hmm. like kinfolk, right? Mm -hmm. And you you treat someone like like you treat your family. With loving care. That's right. I mean, the chief task of the church, the reason Jesus gave us the church is because our chief task is soul care. Mm. And kindness is a really easy and free way, you know, it doesn't cost Mm. you anything, maybe a few seconds of your time to affirm someone's worth and value Mm. and remind them that they are loved. I like that the chief task of the church is soul care. It is. Do you think our church, church today in our country has gotten away from that? Or do we see soul care still as the, because that's different to me than like, well, I wasn't raised in the church. I didn't grow up mm-hmm. in the church. I didn't start attending church till I was like in my early 20s, 21, 22. Mm-hmm. Didn't even know. I got assimilated into church culture. And I remember I was working and someone came up to my desk because I always had my Bible at my desk. You can see this thing's worn and torn. Mm-hmm. But um, he said, I, I, I believe like you have a Bible. Are you a Christian? I was like, I am. And he yeah. said, do you have a church home? And I said, what is that? And he said, huh. well, it's a place that you go and you have fellowship and community. And I was like, what's fellowship? And so he just gave me the whole like church 101. Uh-huh. And that week I went out and I started attending church and, and shopping for churches mm-hmm. because that's what you're doing. Come on, keep it real. Mm-hmm. And I found a church where before every service, um, the pastor's wife would play, but then the pastor would say, and now we're all going to pray. So they dedicated the first five or six minutes of the service to just prayer. Everybody just got to their knees and prayed. And I'm like, this is, this is where I belong. Wow. So when I think about the church here in the United States, because mm-hmm. I've also traveled all over the world, I feel like the first time in my life I experienced kindness and someone treated me like I was valued mm-hmm. and cared for. And no, we're not perfect. We're, you know, we're a, mm-hmm. a fruity family in the family of God. But mm-hmm. I always have such appreciation for the church because mm-hmm. when I was assimilated into church culture coming from what I came from, it was like moving to another planet where people were kind right. and even niceness was appreciated when you come out of the kind of mm-hmm. abuse that I've endured mm-hmm. in my younger years. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. So I appreciate the church. I appreciate how God has is building it, continues to build it, and true disciples across the world are shining the light in some of the darkest I places. That. I love that. Like I've I've heard statements from people constantly, like, why do I need to go to a church? I can get better fellowship at the local bar or at work. And there is some truth to that in the sense that you you can find some friends there. Mm-hmm. But we all know that. Uh, a lot of people will turn and stab you in the back real quick. That's and true. And in the in the church, hopefully, uh, they are different, and they won't. Yeah, and we I won't feel be there's like much that. to celebrate, yeah. and there's not enough celebration going on of what we're doing right. There's mm-hmm. a lot of things, a lot of conversations about what's going wrong, but God sees what we're doing right too, and He affirms us and encourages us mm-hmm. in our well doing as we encourage one another to good works. I'd never yeah. been in an environment where someone would come and talk to you just because they just come up to you and say, hey, what's your name? What brings you here today? Mm. We're so glad you're here. How can I pray for you? The first time I ever heard those words was in an American church. And so I just continue to come and do my part. And now I get to extend that same love wow. to others. Mm. Recapturing the, the miracleness, the magic of that. It is a miracle. Right? Yeah, without yeah. a doubt, man, that's great. So we're here to talk about designing a life of joy. Yes. So how do you define joy? And then how is that different from happiness? Well, joy is different from happiness, because as we know, happiness comes and goes. You know, you gave me a bottled water here, and I was thirsty and had a little tummy trouble today. And I was happy because you Mm -hmm. gave me that. But when it's done, it's done. It's like a quick instantaneous thing. It's very situational. It's based on your environment. But joy is a pervasive sense of well-being. It is, it's an identity feature. It's not just something that comes and goes. It's an identity feature Mm -hmm. that we have access to as Christians. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's rooted and anchored in hope and love. Hmm. And so when you have it, when you have Jesus joy, that's what I call it. Hmm. Nothing can take it away from you. Nothing can steal hmm. it, your circumstance, your situation. Hmm. If it is true Jesus joy hmm. that he teaches about in John 15, 11, where he says, everything I have taught you, everything hmm. I've shared with you is so that my joy would be in you hmm. and your joy would be made complete hmm. or be made full. Oh, yeah. Think, look, think, look at the process in that sentence, hmm. be made complete. So the process is this journey on this side of glory. And so we're on our way to everlasting joy. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, we can live in joy now every yeah. day. Amen. So like mm-hmm. the like the water that you got or mm-hmm. like the happiness is like a it's a byproduct of something, you know, nice that good that happens, right? Yeah. External. And that's mm-hmm. probably like a microcosm of this bigger thing that you're describing that then joy is the byproduct of you said hope. And, and love, and love, anchored in hope, anchored and in love. Christ. Yeah. So, though, and like you can't get rid of that, right? And and, and joy is a thing that kind of emanates from that. It's true. yeah. It reminds me of this song we used to sing when I was in prison. The joy of the Lord is my strength. There you go. I'm not gonna try to sing it <laughs> yeah. for you, but it's more like a repetitive type mm-hmm. thing. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, there it you know, is. And there it's like, is. man, mm-hmm. like that. I miss them songs like that. I man. love that verse. Why do you think that's the case? What do you think that means? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, because it's a supernatural prayer. You're not just singing a song. This mm-hmm. is a prayer of appreciation to God because for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. Mm-hmm. And what was the joy set before him? It was you and it mm-hmm. was me. He saw us and went to the cross. Mm-hmm. So when we appreciate God for that gift, it fuels us up in our spirit and our soul in ways that we can't quite understand in the moment, but mm-hmm. it's what sustains us and carries us and gives us that strength. Mm-hmm. That's the Jesus joy that I like to teach about. Man, yeah. this sister here, boy, woo wee. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I can listen to you all day. And Thank that's you. true. You, ha- you have access to that no matter what mm-hmm. that yeah. is going on. And we need that in our lives. I mean, we're always in life going to find things that we struggle with, you know, and mm-hmm. what work, what can we anchor ourselves in, you know, and it's gotta be Christ. If it's not Christ, it's going to be something that our struggle, we're going to, and we're anchor ourselves to something that's not Christ. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to end up pulling that thing with us mm-hmm. because we're mm-hmm. not really anchored in something that's, that's immovable, mm-hmm. you know, and God is immovable. And so when we anchor ourselves in Christ, like that is our joy. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's like mm-hmm. we have, I don't know, spiritual diabetes. And mm. we, have, we have all these syringes in front of us and we just need one thing. You know, we just need insulin. That's what we need. Mm. But we reach for all these other things and inject ourselves with these other things 
and like we need the syringe that's got Jesus. Yeah, in and it. we talked about last episode how we're wanting to try and change everything in our life and become whatever. And Ooh, the answer, too big. Mm-hmm. yeah, the answer is no. It's it's you need God, you need Jesus in your life, mm-hmm. and in this moment, then, yeah, yeah. So we all have our um, like our origin stories of um, what has happened to us. I know, <laughs> I know, I have mine, and Lewis has his, but. But your story you, has trauma in it and has led you um, to overcome trauma. So could you share more about this with us? Sure, I'd be glad to. I'm getting better and better at this. I just did another podcast interview last week where I said, you know, I, I, I didn't share this for many years. I'm in broadcasting now for 20 years, and I didn't share it because I thought it's such a bummer. You know, who wants to hear it? But now I know that this, it's helping a lot of people to hear so it. Yeah. And I thought, oh, my, my Christian story is so boring. I found Jesus, fell in love, and never looked back. Mm. The end. But before all of that, mm. I, I was born into a literal whirlwind of chaos and trauma and drama. Uh, my father was drug addicted, alcoholic, uh, uh, brutally beat my mother on a regular basis. Mm. They were married mm. for 13 years. And so in all wow. of that chaos and abuse and darkness, uh, finally, after they divorced, we wound up homeless. My mother, my sisters and I were homeless in the streets of Alamogordo. And so as a very young child experiencing homelessness, actually experiencing hunger, I know what it's like to yeah. be starving mm-hmm. and um, to not know, literally not know where your next meal is going to come from. So when that that kind of trauma happens to you in your formative years, I'm what's called a complex trauma survivor. So I have multiple levels of trauma. That's the psychological term for those who have multiple levels of trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lewis, you know, mm-hmm. you know, we have that in common. Mm-hmm. I'm also a pre-verbal trauma survivor. I have second degree burns on my body from when I was about six months old. Wow. So everything mm-hmm. in my journey, in my most formative years, was traumatic and painful and hard. And so I had no idea um, that... I knew that human beings could have a life that was different, but I figured that was something that was for others. You know, it wasn't for me, my mom and my sisters when we're living in the streets with nowhere to go, coming out of all that abuse. Um, I had no idea that life could be good until I became a teenager Mm. and have always, I've always worked. And so I was working, I went to high school half the day and the other half the day I I worked a job to pay Mm. bills, keep the lights on, buy Mm. food. Um, I've been working since I was 14 years old mm. to help take care of my siblings and mm. and our and our life. You know, I've been paying bills since I was in middle school. Mm-hmm. But um, mm. I was carpooling to my job in high school. And one day the woman who was driving us, Miss Linda Jarvis, she dropped mm. me off at the house and she said, Junie, before you go, I have a book for you. And I know you like to read. And this book might help you to learn th- about your true worth. And at the time, I didn't believe mm. I had any worth. Mm. So here I am, 17, with this Bible for teens. It was an NIV study Bible for teens. It had these wow. teenagers on the front cover trying to look cool. I'll never forget. <laughs> I mean, I wore that thing out. But I started reading and I couldn't put it down. Mm. And within the pages of, of God's word, I met Jesus. Mm. And... I just found Psalm 27, when my father and mother forsake Mm. me, the Lord will take me in. I read over and over again, the book of Job over and over again, Mm. that there is a God who loves us so much and he can turn even the worst things into something good. And so from age 17 on up, I started following God, being Mm. discipled through his word. And I believed this, the, the, the short of it is that I believed when Jesus said, my children, my sheep hear Mm. my voice and they will not follow another. I said, speak Lord, I'm listening. And my faith has continued to be that simple. One of my co-hosts, Carl, he used to say, you're a literalist because I'll read a scripture and I'll, I I just believe. Mm-hmm. And that's a, a gift I feel the Lord has given me where I just, I trust him and I believe him. And so I've designed my life after him, after his own, after his heart. I've just been chasing Jesus since I was 17. Mm. Amen. Wow. Wow. So this is maybe off script a little bit, but your siblings, you still in contact with them? Oh, yes. All of them. We are very close. I mean, how many of them is there? There's seven of us. I'm the second oldest of seven. So my older sister, Teruko, my heritage on my mother's side is Japanese. So Teruko, me and my younger sister, Mariko, the top three, we kind of raised the younger four. Okay. um, And we're still very, very close. That's cool. And and mm -hmm. what about your parents? Um, Well, my mother passed in 2015. Okay. I'm sorry. Praise God. Oh. She, um, my mom was sick as long as I knew her. I oh, never knew wow. her well. Oh. So, but she's well now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Amen. Yes. Yeah, so my mother passed in 2015. I have no idea where my father is, if he's living or dead. The last time I saw him, I was like, um, well, no, wait. I, he left when I was not eight, eight going on nine. And that was during that season where we were homeless. And you grew up in the <laughs> South, right? Uh, no, I grew up everywhere. I have lived oh. all over the place. We moved 18 times before my wow. 20th birthday. 
Wow, man. And that then that that can be traumatizing in itself with not developing like good relationships mm-hmm. with friends. I mean, you have plenty of siblings to kind of be friends with, but it's different to have. Oh well, I've always been very social. I still have my best friend from seventh grade. We're still best oh, friends. Okay. We ran the Chicago Marathon together. Wow. wow okay. So <laughs> still my best develop... friend from tenth grade. Okay. You know, and then you just... got your your husband, who you said at fifteen. So, yes. <laughs> so that's a, so I guess even with moving so many times, like you were blessed with able to have maybe short but deep relationships, or well, I just. I love people and, Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I feel like maybe that's a gift, but I've always loved people and and getting to know people and Mm -hmm. um, being loved by and loving back. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's, it's easy. It's never been hard for me to, to, to have and maintain friendships. Mm -hmm. What about your, the trauma that you experienced? What about that story? Do you think people need to hear today? Well, I think that I, from a very young age, made some decisions that were important. For example, when we were homeless, my mother, she always managed to keep us in school. So Mm -hmm. I remember when I was in, I was nine years old and I was at school and they sat us in front of that Apple IIe computer. You remember Mm -hmm. that Apple IIe computer? Mm -hmm. And I inserted that, that disc to conquer the Oregon trail. That was when I fell in love with (laughs) things work. I sat there as a nine year old and I thought I have to know how this works. Mm -hmm. And so that was one thing. Um, and I'm I'm a researcher, so I like to know how things work, including, mm-hmm. you know, the human creation. Mm-hmm. I like to understand my mind and my body, how that works. That started at a very early age. And also, when I was 12, um, my mother had remarried, and he was in the Army, so we moved to Germany. And in the seventh grade, someone got a bright idea to take a school bus full of children to one of the largest remaining death camps. So mm-hmm. they took a school bus full of 12- and 13-year-olds to Dachau. Mm-hmm. And I can remember being 12 and walking those gravel roads and, and standing in the gas chambers and looking mm-hmm. at the incinerating ovens and the bunks. And at the time, I already knew that this life could be very, mm-hmm. very hard and evil and unfair. Mm-hmm. I already knew that. Yeah. But as a 12-year-old there at Dachau, I decided there's enough evil, there's enough hunger, there's enough abuse, there's enough want in this world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know how or even what I'm saying, but I will be a part of what's good yeah, in this yeah, world. Yeah. There has to be a way yeah. to be a part of what's good in this world. If it's possible to be that evil, mm. then there has to be a way. Mm. And so that really stayed with me, that promise that I made as a 12-year-old. And then after I started reading the scriptures as, as at age 17, mm. I realized that the most kind and wonderful person who ever walked the earth was mm. Jesus Christ. And then I changed that promise to, I will be a part of what's good yeah. in this world by living and loving like Jesus. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I just, you know, it's, I'm sure you've heard it many times when you've shared your story, but ju- the grace of God in your life and his protection and his provision mm-hmm. is just interweaved all throughout, you know, what you've said. And and definitely for people may, that may think, man, I have no purpose in life. A person can look at your story and, and make a case that there's no purpose in a life like this. Mm-hmm. Like, why does this life even exist? Mm-hmm. But yeah. When we look at what your life is today and the impact God has continued to have in your life and then the impact that your life has had and is still having on other people's mm-hmm. lives, if you can't see purpose in that, then you blind mm-hmm. <laughs> and and I don't know what else to say, but you're blind. Well, it's like a gospel reframing. Like you could look at your life and everything you've been through, like you said, Lewis, and it c- could be reason for despairing and giving up. Or you could put the gospel reframe on it and say, no, actually, I'm reframing this because uh, I want to be part of the solution now, for instance. Yes. And I'm using mm-hmm. this stuff that I learned to, to relate and to help and so forth. That's right. And one of the, the beautiful things about technology and programming and coding is that it happens one keystroke at a time. And mm-hmm. I could easily see, even from a very young age, that the, the lives that we're living, we are designing one keystroke at a time. If you can think tiny, because mm-hmm. that's God's system yeah, yeah. for us. We're designed to literally move forward through literal baby steps, mm-hmm. tiny steps. And so I started thinking about ways at a very early age that I could be different, be mm-hmm. a part of what's good, be a part of the solution and not the mm-hmm. promise. And it's just proven to be... I think it's the what Jesus had in mind when he said, seek first mm-hmm. the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. That's mm-hmm. another scripture I read as a teenager and took literally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I will seek you first. I love that. The tiny, the power, the power of the tiny. And <laughs> that's all over in the gospels too. Jesus says, hey, here's an idea. Mm-hmm. Just give a cold cup of water to someone. That's yeah. right. Just or, do these little actions. Yeah, Matthew 17, the mustard seed. Yeah. yeah, It's God's design for human behavior, which is why I teach for the Stanford Behavior Design Lab. What is that? 
Oh, the Stanford Behavior yeah. Design Lab. Yes. Well, the founder, Dr. B.J. Fogg, he back in the 90s, he coined the term persuasive technology back during the time where nobody thought technology would be persuasive. And so as technology became proven to be persuasive, he transitioned it into behavior design. It's the same science. It's the mm -hmm. formula for human behavior. He's a behavior scientist. And so I trained under Dr. B.J. Fogg. He's mm -hmm. um, a mentor and one of my favorite teachers on the mm -hmm. planet. But I teach for his teaching team because behavior design is a comprehensive system for thinking clearly about human behavior and designing simple ways to transform lives. Mm. And so we help organizations, uh, companies um, of all shapes and sizes. I'm doing some training this week with the U.S. Department of Labor in the behavior design mindset. Mm. And at the at the root of it is this tiny thinking, this this mm. mindset of the tiny things that lead to the big changes that we all want to make. Wow. That just blew my mind. Yeah. Like I'm like, I want to learn more about that. It sounds <laughs> oh, I cool. hope you will. <laughs> you it read, sounds you cool. read the book, you'll get plenty of it. You'll get like a okay. high right. level. Yep. <laughs> well, in an age in an our age of celebrity and appearance and mm. um, and billions of likes and that, we shy away from the if it can't be big, then we, we don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. And, and, and that technology, the the likes, the tiny spark of mm. um, affirmation that you get from social media, that's all rooted in persuasive mm. technology. You know, we, we, we have a human need. As much as we need air, food, and water, mm -hmm. we have a human need for affirmation. Yeah. We need to be seen and valued. Mm -hmm. And that's why our technology can be so addictive. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world with social media and why... People can be on an extreme high mm -hmm. because they got likes and then they could immediately drop to an extreme low because they didn't get enough likes mm -hmm. yeah. or the right people didn't like their stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's it, unsustainable. Yeah, it's a I call it the I call it the digital lottery, the social media. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You know, because you're pulling, it's like a slot machine. Yeah. You get all those likes, yeah. you might go viral. I mean, they've done studies on it. It's like it's it is a lottery yeah. to go mm. viral. So you're you're paying with your time to get that attention, but you can get it from a, a source that'll never fail or run out. And Probably. his name is Jesus. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So in addition to being an author, radio host, a speaker, like all these cool good things, and we talked about the behavioral design, like I'm trying to figure out, like, so you're doing all this stuff, like, how how can you manage to do, I don't know, it seems like a lot. Well, I don't do it unless it's fun. Okay. And here's the okay. thing, just like we have a need for air, food, and water, and affirmation, we have a human need for fun and celebration. Mm, yeah. That's something else that we mm. teach in the behavior design community. Everything is about including celebration because it is a basic human need. So I don't do it if it's not fun. When it's not fun anymore, mm. I stop doing it. Okay. So, okay. you know, when you're having fun, it's easy to, to, to keep going. But when it's something that you're not, you know, it, you're, it's you're trudging through, you don't have grace for it, then, you know, that's what makes it a lot of work. Okay. So All right. It sounds like a lot, but I just do what's fun. I, I just, I hear, I, I read all that stuff and I'm like, multitasking like they say women are better at that than men oh that's an illusion we I'm, can only think of one we can I'm only terrible. do one thing at a time we're just fooling yeah. ourselves we're just doing it really fast yeah well, I, I i can't only do like one maybe two if the second one is like not that deep eating <laughs> oh, no, i can do that easy yeah. man i do that in my sleep that's what i can do yeah <laughs> um so joy is an essential uh component yes. uh for an abundant life so and that probably takes us into the John 15, mm, yes. 11 verse. But but why is that? And, and, and what does that verse say? Well, Jesus says in that verse that everything that he has taught us, everything that he's revealed to us is so that his joy would be in us and our mm -hmm. joy would be made complete. So that leads to the question of, you know, what is his joy? You know, we mm -hmm. want to get his joy, not our joy. Mm -hmm. But Jesus's joy is love and family and community. That is true abundance. Mm. If the church could catch hold of that, what a beautiful, beautiful thing we would be. True abundance, family, love, community. Mm -hmm. So our joy is made complete when we are living out that love, shining his light so that others will see what God is like and glorify mm -hmm. the Father who's in heaven. What we are to be known for is, yes, our love as disciples, but also our joy in that love. And there's such a gift that we have mm. every day to meet someone new or to spend time with someone that we already are in a relationship with and sow those seeds of joy into that relationship. There's a joy in your, there's a part of your brain that lights up with all the good hormones, you know, the dopamine spark. That's what I call it. When you see someone and you're happy to see them mm. and they're happy to see you, that's the Jesus joy. Mm. He's always happy to see and be with you. He made you to know you and love you and be with you forever. And guess what? When you're with him, you're the whole thing. You're the mm. whole world to Jesus. He loves you like that. 
If we could live in that joy and mm-hmm. overflow that kind of love, then our world would be a much different place. I can't help but notice the uh, the relationship component of that as mm-hmm. you outline that, because it's your relationship with Jesus, with a family, with the community. Those are all relationships. Yes. So it seems like uh, there's there's some kind of substance in that that where joy is communicated or processed through relationships. Mm-hmm. It comes from valuing one another for the true treasures that we are. I mean, mm. C.S. Lewis said, you never meet an ordinary person. Yeah. You know, mm. we are miraculous, wondrous yep. beings. Yep. And when we keep that in mind, even in conflict, we can still have a relationship. You don't have to lose your joy in conflict. You know, I'm a married woman. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> you know, so my husband and I, we've come up with lots of ways that no matter what we're going through to keep that joy going strong, for example, and it's tiny things. One mm-hmm. thing that we do is every time we see each other at the end of a, you know, typical work day, he'll tell me a joke. Mm-hmm. And so I know the first thing he's going to do is give me a big hug and then he's going to mm-hmm. tell me a joke because I love a good goofy joke. Wow. I got a couple I want to hit you right? with. Go <laughs> when, ahead and finish. When you grow up without a dad, you, and you I love dad jokes. And God tells the best dad jokes, but my husband comes home, he'll tell me a joke. He told me one this, uh, this past week where he said, what did Noah, what does Noah do on the ark when the chickens get out of, what is he? Oh yeah. Okay. Why did Noah put the chickens in timeout? And you know, Mm -mm. because they were using foul language. (laughs) Oh, that's great. So he'll come home and he'll even ask his clients. He's a carpet and flooring technician. He'll ask his clients, I need a joke for my wife. So he'll come home with a joke. And that's something that creates joy. The anticipation Mm -hmm. of his, I'm going to see him. And even when we're in conflict, he's going to tell me a joke. Yeah. So, so what do you call a can opener that's broken? I don't know. A can't opener. (laughs) See, right? It doesn't take much. I just love it. I got one better than that for you. What? What's Darth Vader's wife's name? I don't know. What is it? Ella. Ella? Ella Vader. Ella! (laughs) I know you like that because of Star Wars. So you got something to hit it with. If you have any good jokes that you'd like to email us at bumperstickerfaith at gmail.com, feel free. Please, and we yes. may air them on the show. And I will share them on the air on Moody Radio. I tell jokes on the air. Oh, snap. <laughs> the cornier, the all right, better. All right. All right. I love a good joke. Yeah, I got a real good one, but it's too long for right now. All right. <laughs> what do you call? I'll share it afterwards. What do you call um, a guy who looks down on everybody else? Because he can tell more corn puns. He's, I don't know. <laughs> he's, he's just corn descending. He's corn, corn descending. descending. I was going to say Sam. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> corn descending. Did you just make that That's up? That's vocabulary. Yeah. Oh, he, yeah, he just, just, made, made, he just made that up. All right. All right. Which you can tell. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so what about believing your own BS? Oh, yes. Bumper, I, bumper stickers, that is. I <laughs> laughed out loud when I saw that. Something on Instagram that Lewis posted where he said, believe in your own BS. And I texted you that day when I saw it. I thought, this mm-hmm. is so great. Well, as I shared, I come from a you know pretty traumatic background, backstory. But when I started reading the word, and as I said, the simplicity of belief, I would find promises in the word about me as a person. And I just chose to believe. So when I was a very young woman, I would write with Sharpies all over my arms, my hands. I'd have sticky notes mm-hmm. in the car, in the, in my room, um, who I am in Christ. Mm-hmm. And so I started memorizing and and saying out, speaking wow. it out, yeah. speaking it out, because, you know, mm-hmm. the things that we speak out, they, be, they manifest. We're made in the image yep. of God. Yep. And everything that we speak and that we think about ourselves is like that keystroke in the line of code. I always say that trauma is bad code, but you can rewrite the code. You can Mm. reprogram Mm. it. And so the first thing that God taught me was who I am in Christ. And I remember I had an accountability partner. That was another Mm. thing. I found a church that I loved and then I I joined the choir Mm. and um, Mm. um, my friend, Nicole, we're still friends. She came up to me and she said, 
um, I'm here studying for a master's degree. Do you have an accountability partner? And I was like, <laughs> what is that? What is yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> so she said, let's meet in the library every week. And so we started doing memory verses, who I am in Christ, learning mm. my identity in Christ. And, you know, you mm. hear a lot about these personality tests, you know, or what are you, ENFJ or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cannot Seven tell you. I was at a, um, yeah, right. I was at an event um, with True Face Ministries in Georgia, and we were having dinner after we recorded these Bible study lessons. And everybody was talking about their number, their Enneagram number. And I'd never done it. Mm. Mm. I just stay, I just stay away from that stuff because I learned my identity from the word Mm -hmm. through who I am in Christ. I didn't need a personality test. God says, you know, the scripture says, search me and know me. If there's any wicked way in me, Lord, Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything, he knows everything about us, a word before we speak. So I would just ask God. And over the years, whatever he told me, I decided to believe Mm -hmm. and repeat so I could re- reprogram my mind mm-hmm. from all the abusive things. You know, mm-hmm. when you grow up in an environment of emotional and physical abuse, you hear a lot of lies. Yeah. You know, you're stupid. I get called stupid a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, you're ugly. You, I, I just, I could go on and on. You ain't never going to be nothing. I heard yeah. that a lot. And I had to find a way to believe what God said about me. Mm -hmm. And so from a very early age, I started memorizing Mm -hmm. these things. You know, I'm complete in Christ. I Mm -hmm. have this uh, handout that I share with you, my eternal identity in Christ. I'm a new creation in Christ. Let's say you just hang on to that from first, from second Corinthians Corinthians 5, 17. You know, what if you just hang on to that for a year every day? I'm a new creation in Christ Mm -hmm. all throughout the day. You're reprogramming your mind with the truth. My body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. My life is rooted in Christ. If you read through who you are in Christ and choose to believe, I'm complete. I lack nothing. Colossians 2, Philippians 4. This is on two sides. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm free from the law of sin and death. If we could speak the truth over who we are, our identity in Christ, and be intentional and strategic about it. That's something that we teach in behavior design. Goals do not work. Systems do. Be intentional and strategic about who you are in Christ so that you can stop believing your Mm -hmm. own BS about you. Mm -hmm. What does God say about you? That you are loved, valued, and treasured forever. What does the world say about you? That's not true. Mm -hmm. Learn to speak a second language and become fluent in the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen. We need that more than ever now in our culture because it's speaking a whole bunch of ungodly, like hopeless things about Mm -hmm. a myriad of things, sex, money relationships you know it's, it's it's crazy how this world is taking such a big left turn if you will but is it really i mean solomon said there's nothing new under the sun that's true that's true so we're just having the yeah. same conversations yeah in I, modern I, terms I, I believe i totally agree i think social media and has the amplified. internet has just put it out there where it's easier to see because i agree mm-hmm. this stuff this stuff ain't new it's been going on I think people are becoming more comfortable now mm-hmm. than ever with coming out. But the the ideology has been there. It just hasn't played out because of fear. And now that so many people come out, the ones that have fear don't have that fear anymore because there's a community. And there's mm-hmm. bunches of communities that are out there now that are accepting anything. Like, you want to be a rabbit? Hey, there's a community of us rabbits over here. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, for it's real. True. And it's so true. it's like, wow, it's man, it's, yeah. on, it's on blast now more than it's ever been and more prevalent. And as we talked about in prior episodes, like that hopelessness that people have, they're, they're stretching. I mean, if, if you feel like you can have hope because you can be a bunny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, how is that really feeling this emptiness you have mm-hmm. inside by saying you could be a bunny? Because cause it's going to be kind of cool in the beginning when you put on a costume or you change your name or you hop around. Mm-hmm. And act like a bunny, but that's going to get old real quick. (laughs) Yeah, but at the same time, Mm -hmm. you might, in your community of other bunnies, find someone who can point you to something that's eternal. Oh, amen. And so that's the thing. It's one of the, I really appreciate my publisher, um, Nat Press and Tyndale House. My book came out. Um, I'm the first author to show up at sci-fi conventions. I Mm -hmm. set up right beside my husband selling his art, you know, and um, offering hope of the gospel to those who are cosplaying out at those events, you know. So it's, it's easier to find your tribe now in the digital age for sure. And God has strategically positioned us in all these places and spaces mm. where we wouldn't expect the gospel to come through loud and clear. We had um, Dr. Ingrid Farrow on an episode. Do you know her? We have well, just in, we were both serving at North, Northern Seminary together for a while. For like she, in past- she spoke mm-hmm. about um, the seeds that we sow into our lives and yeah. these words as the seeds and these little tiny things that whether negative or positive, but especially the negative stories, seeds in your life that people have tr- have sown in there. Yes. And it, if you 
you know, cultivate them, nurture them through self pity or despair. Like yeah. they're going to grow up. You and, nurture them. That's right. And they're going to, mm-hmm. you know, strangle you and bear a very ugly fruit. But to fight back against that, you sow the wheat among the weeds, right? You mm-hmm. sow the good yeah. seeds. The truth. The truth. Yes. And as you're going out to conventions or wherever you're at, mm-hmm. that's like, that's part of our mission and purpose too, to sow those true seeds. That's yeah, right. Mm-hmm. I think, I think something for me, at least I only been out of prison like 13 years now, which is a pretty long time. But like, I came out with this like box mentality. We talked about mm-hmm. being in a box. Like this is what Christianity is. And it kind of is in a box. Mm-hmm. And when I would, when I would have thought about a Christian that's playing video games a lot <laughs> or, or being into sci-fi, yeah. I would have, I would have mm. cringed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said that's bad, but because it was so different than what I thought being a Christian was, yes. it would have made me go, Ugh, or like me being a person that made like that, I would have felt like I I can't like Gotta that. Gotta give it up. Nope. <laughs> you, you don't know, have to and know. so when I when I think about like, I mean, mm. I know you, like you're a personal friend of mine. I know your husband, and like, you know, we've gone and played video games together. Like, there's nobody I'd rather have at a sci-fi convention or a video game convention than you, someone that I would hear on the radio and be like, man, like <laughs> this this sister like got it. Like she know the word. Her life is about the word, and it's like. Well, we need to be available for those people at these conventions. Yes. I, I want, I want you at these conventions. <laughs> I'll invite you to the next one. You'll get to see the whole family. We all, you know, sell our sci-fi art, and yeah. I have a banner that I put up where I let people know you are loved, you are known, mm-hmm. you are chosen, you are worthy, you are enough, and that you know. And your, I cosplay the last sci-fi convention I did where I was um, presenting this gospel message i cosplayed as riri williams and now everybody knows who riri is because she's in the new wakanda forever movie they messed up her backstory but she's in the movie Mm -hmm. so yeah you know i I still you know cosplay and we just have a good time i just feel that's so important to emphasize because it does go on with the bumper sticker uh faith uh, the theme of bumper stickers because um it's very integrated you're integrated you're more integrated than a a lot of people because i think when we think about church and going to church, showing up for God, showing up at church. Uh, we tend to think, well, now I'm g- going to be the church version of myself. Mm, no. <laughs> like, and I'm going to say whatever, what I think everyone wants to hear. I'm going to mimic back what I think uh, God wants to hear, what the other people in church want to hear. And then when I come home, I'll do, I'll be myself. Mm, that's a and lot of work. That's a lot of work and it's not healthy. You're not integrated, actually. To be integrated is to be whole and to be able to show up in both settings. As yourself. As yourself. Mm, yes. Amen. As, a, as a whole person. That's actually, that's what's healthiest. And and I say, it's not just that it's not healthy, but it's dangerous too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And here's why. And because I know from personal experience, and that is, th- that begins to foster a split in you. Yes. Mm-hmm. Where divisions within. Divisions within. That's and right. so then s- say you do get into uh, something that really is unhealthy or sinful, then it's a whole lot easier to hide that and to compartmentalize it and say, oh, this doesn't affect the church or this doesn't affect anyone else. This is just, I'll just keep this separated and that can, that gets really dangerous. And one of the main problems I think is that we forget to have fun. I mean, God invented mm-hmm. fun. Fun is mm-hmm. such a great cure for fear. I mean, when you're having mm-hmm. fun yeah. and it's sincere and it's healthy fun, it's then you just feel empowered to just stay, come alive and stay alive when you're having fun. I think if, um, you had KJ Johnson mm-hmm. from the C.S. Lewis Institute you've had on this podcast. He was at my house on Monday. And you know what we did? We played like an, an hour and a half of Uno he and his wife, me and my husband. I mean, and they are very competitive. Mm. We laughed so hard. Then we played Bananagrams. Uh, yeah. I, have a, I have some robot ninjas that fight each other. And we we did that. We just played. Mm. We played all night this week on Monday with the founder of the C.S. Lewis Institute. Mm. And we were kids again. Mm-hmm. And it was so refreshing. Mm. And it was so refueling. And our friendship grows when we play. We have mm. fun, you know. And God's with us. He loves to see his kids having fun and playing. And it's just, it's a, it's a need. So we got to learn yeah. how to have fun again and stop taking ourselves so seriously. I'm jealous. Having okay, <laughs> you're, invited. you're invited. You're invited. Here, here's my <laughs> argument for that as a heavenly activity: having fun and yeah. just playing is one of the most heavenly things we can do. Yeah. For this reason, because it has no purpose, 
right? It's just pointless. Well, I don't think so. And well, well, hear me out for a second, because everything that we tend to do has a purpose. Like mm. we go to work to achieve this goal. We do this activity, achieve this. We, I do this podcast for some, for some goal that's outside further on. But when you're in heaven, like God is your goal. Like there's nothing else. Like I, I'm not doing something to do to earn another purpose because he is my purpose. So therefore yeah. everything we do in heaven will be purposeless because he's the only purpose. Hmm. And so uh, playing games here is a way to emphasize that to yourself, like to get your ego out of the way to say, okay, I'm going to take this time. I'm just going to be, do this pointless thing. Cause it's going to be remind, it's going to remind me of what it's like to be in heaven where my agenda is gone. And God is the whole point. Mm, well, I think I'm going to have lots of fun in and, heaven too. But yeah. I just, you know, from from the perspective of someone, and my husband would say the same, when you're denied a childhood, mm. when your childhood is not fun, I can remember I was about 22 and I, I was calling out to God and I said, Lord, my childhood is over and I missed it. He said, your childhood is just beginning. Go play. Wow. And I haven't stopped. Um, so <laughs> I, we, our family motto is pray hard, play hard, <laughs> play hard <laughs> and never give up. Play hard, pray hard, and never give up. I don't parent. I play. I have a son who just graduated from from college, and he's one of the most joyful people you'd ever met. Mm. I have a 17-year-old, and they just they just know how to have fun. Mm. And I feel like that's a gift to them in addition to their faith is that they know how to. And you need, you need to know so you can calm yourself when you're going through those big emotions, those hard times. You need to know how to bring yourself back to a place of calm. So you have to know, you know, mm. what's fun for you on a spectrum of activities that yeah, really yeah. does restore your joy and remind you that your situation is not your destiny yeah. and yeah. the sorrow is not your permanent address. I, I like that because really like that. fun can be different, right? It can look different. Like for a person that's not into video games or board games or whatever, mm -hmm. like that might not be fun for them, but it may be something else. Yes. Yeah. Reading a book. Mm -hmm. And it could be biographies. It could be sci-fi. It could be anything. But so fun can be defined differently. Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. everybody, and that's okay. Playing it with is. playing with your dog. That's okay. playing with your dog. I mean, uh, Dallas Willard is one of my favorite. Um, well, he's you know with the Lord now, but yeah. I consider him a mentor. But you know, he said God was having fun when He made the multiverse. Mm. God loves to play, and He loves to see us having fun. Was that in right. Divine Conspiracy? I believe. So. Do you remember Dallas Willard? That was one of the. I became a Christian in college. Okay, and that that was one of the first books I ever read. Um, <laughs> not that book, but another one of his books. Yeah, one of the greatest compliments I received from my publisher, NavPress, when they read through my manuscript, mm. he said, this is very Willardian. I was like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Willardian. Yeah, <laughs> Dallas Willard. Cool. But yeah, it's just, I, I keep it fun. And in the times where I need to be sad, I make time mm. to be sad. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's healthy so to not embrace. Fake no, happy. not at all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sorrow is a gift. That, like yeah. you said, the gift of sorrow. Uh, Chicago yeah. Pastor Bob Moeller, he's one of the ones that helped me to understand that sorrow is a gift. Jesus was a man of sorrows, acquainted with mm -hmm. grief. And so we can bring all of our feelings, what we're going through to God. He'll help us process through. My youngest one time came home from school and he said, Mom, I need to go in my room. I need time to be sad. And mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. yep. We need to make time to feel what mm -hmm. we're feeling. But then we also need to learn how to strategically return to joy mm -hmm. because our celebration is in the Lord. That sounds like a habit for soul care. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. <laughs> Just because like, Absolutely. I know for me, like growing up, I learned that anything outside of fun or feeling good is a problem. Mm -hmm. and you need to get out of that as quick as you can so you can wow. get back to having fun and, and being at peace. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it was running away from the issues and yeah. not dealing with them because when you deal with them, that can take time. You know, but mm -hmm. I learned as being a Christian or being in Christ that, you need to deal with with things like through the lens of Christ and the gospel, but there is a grieving time. Yes, mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. a time to be sorrow. There is a there is a time to be in pain, and sometimes pain is just one step removed from like being your best self. Mm -hmm. There you go. But yeah. to be mm -hmm. in in that pain and live in it, there is value in that. Yes, mm -hmm. like getting stitches. Mm -hmm. You know, like I got to cut that hurts, but then to get more holes poked in me creates more mm -hmm. pain. But that pain is going to help stop the predicate issue, which is this yeah, yeah. hole I got in my body or this That's rip right. in my mm -hmm. skin. So, you know, there's value yeah. in that. And so I'm, I'm glad you said that. And I think to have Christ as the focal point in that pain to help, but also have a community around you yes. to help you. Because mm -hmm. sometimes we need yeah. help in our grieving, like. 
like I know for me personally, I'm I'm a super extrovert people person. Yeah, me too. But I do need <laughs> time to sometimes sit back and Be still. and think through things. Yes. Mm-hmm. Deal with things, but then I need to be around some people that I can like get this mm-hmm. out of me, and they can wrap their arms around yeah. me. And when that happens, the healing yeah. comes like that. It's and they true. validate what you're going through. But we're designed to heal yeah. in community. Yes, yes, yes. And that's another reason why I teach behavior design is that's because so huge. it reminds us that we're designed. Everything is about community. Mm-hmm. Like I said, true abundance is mm-hmm. family and fellowship and friends. And so we get, we come together, we grieve together, mm-hmm. we celebrate together, and we play together. Mm-hmm. That's what it's supposed to be about. But we mm-hmm. complicate things by, you know, posturing for positions of power and trying to accumulate the most junk and things like that. And I think that is so, so important to emphasize that we heal in community. We do. Mm-hmm. It's like when Paul in the Bible talks about we're each body parts, members of the yes. same body. Mm-hmm. Like I could chop off my finger and leave it over there. It's not, it's not going to get better on its own. You know, we need the entire body to help us to be healthy. And if you're disconnected from a healthy church body, for instance, yeah, mm-hmm. there's no way, there's a little way you're going to be healthy. But I think that a lot of times people want to dive in and it's not the, it's not the big leaps. They're unsustainable. It's baby steps. Mm. It's say you haven't been to church in a few years because you got burned, you got hurt. Take mm-hmm. some baby steps. Think about some people you admire in the family of faith. Reach out to them, send them a text message, invite mm-hmm. them for coffee, reconnect. On a micro level, remember one line of code, one keystroke in a line of code, reconnect on a micro level, and then gradually let God lead you back into a healthy community because you need to take time to learn who's safe. That takes time. And we like to rush things, but that's not God's way. Yeah, I think think the onus also needs to be on other people that's in the church to be checking on those who have been wounded and have been hurt. Mm -hmm. And it's the Mm -hmm. worst thing that when a person pulls away, that people just kind of look at them and like, oh, well, you know, Jesus said they were among us, but they weren't of us. So just let them let them go. And it's like, well, that mm-hmm. could be true, but but maybe it's not true. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and to me, that's the lack of, you know, that phrase, the church being the church. Yeah. You know, the mm-hmm. church isn't just a church doing evangelism. The church being a church is also like tending to the flock. That's right. Mm-hmm. And, it, yeah. and it and it's a pet peeve of mine where there's when there's not a good balance of that in the church where you know, we should be evangelizing and making disciples, but we also should be caring for caring the sheep for that we already another. have. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I'll, I'll never forget a, a pastor, um, Colin Smith, that I learned from in a class he was teaching where he talked about being prophet, priest, and king. And he mm-hmm. talked about his own life that he splits it up in thirds. You know, mm-hmm. there's a time where he's being the prophet when he's preaching. Mm-hmm. There's a time where he's the king, and that's the leadership mm-hmm. of, of in the church. And then there's the priest yeah. and that's the caring mm. for the flock. And I just, that always stuck with me and I hope it never leaves because even though I'm not a pastor of a church, the ministry I'm involved in, like those three things are in it. And I need to make sure that I have ample time doing each of those things mm-hmm. and not just like, you know, oh, I want to always be in the word and, and, and mm-hmm. teaching the word but I don't want to care for the sheep. Like I need to be caring for the sheep or I, I shouldn't shun my leadership responsibilities. Like I need to be the leader mm-hmm. that God set me to be That's right. and not mm-hmm. run from that. So yeah. Yeah. Cause he always catches up with you. I tried to run for ministry. I quit my show, started a tech consulting company doing great. And then the Lord was like, all right, you ready to come back? <laughs> you know, you can never outrun I'm the I'm glad Lord. you're back, boy. I ain't going to lie. Well, now I get to do back. both, so that's a blessing. I'm someone who uh, struggles, I think, mm. with grieving. Oh, Is there mm. something that you do when you when, when you need to grieve um, rather than, like, I'm more apt to, like, deny it, suppress it, shove it under somewhere or, or distract myself from it? Is there anything that you do? do intentionally that you're aware of Well, you know, when you need to grieve? It's different for every situation that you're grieving. Mm-hmm. And um, for example, I have um, someone in my life who's very close to me who's been having a lot of trouble finding a job. And I think last week she finally just let it out and she just, she just cried. She just fell apart, mm-hmm. you know, and that was, that to me was a move forward for her mm-hmm. because you need to grieve. The struggle is real. When you go through something that's crushing, 
It's okay to be sad. And I think about how my grandmother, my adoptive grandmother passed away the first week of March, like mm. this month. And so oh, wow. I, I was traveling a weekend before last for a funeral and helping my auntie who was caring for her. And I saw the different ways that everybody was grieving through. And when I got back and I'm the kind of person where I'm there and when I'm with you, you're all we're it's just us. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't realize I had absorbed a lot of other mm. person's mm -hmm. grief, cousins mm -hmm. and, and my aunt and all. So last week there was a couple of days where I just laid on the floor and cried mm. and that's okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you need to feel your feelings and you need to grieve. I think of it as like before I went gluten-free, sugar-free, got all that inflammation out of my body. That's mm. a whole nother show. Mm. I teach a class on sugar-free living, <laughs> but um, mm. I had asthma, but going sugar-free and gluten-free cured my asthma. Mm -hmm. wow. But back before when I had asthma, I'd always have to have my rescue inhaler on me mm -hmm. for when I got triggered perfume or exhaust, mm -hmm. I would have an asthma attack and I use my rescue inhaler. So I think of like having a panic attack or just falling apart and just being a pile of tears on the floor mm -hmm. is like me taking my rescue inhaler. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a person with limitations. That's good. And when sadness comes, let sadness comes, you know, you know, fall apart at work, but you know, make time yeah. to get yeah. with God no. and feel it and be sad. Let him embrace you and hold mm -hmm. you um, and just love you back to a place where yeah, you yeah. can. That's, that's a humility that I mm -hmm. need because I think, oh no, I got it. I'm I'm bigger than I am. Yeah, I know for me when I'm grieving, like when it's mm. so when I'm grieving, if I can't grieve and like let it go, I gotta get in a place by myself and I have to sit down and have a real conversation with myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Talk to myself and then I also have to talk to God. Yeah. Healing and, takes time. Yeah, and mm. I have to, mm. you know, get it out of the the grieving yeah. for me that I can't get out is usually um driven by anger. Mm -hmm. So if yeah. I'm if I'm sad, if I can't release that sadness, mm -hmm. then then I'm really mad. Yeah. Then you mm -hmm. get angry. And I, I and get angry and I have probably to, are hard on yourself sometimes. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have to I have to get with God and I have to like pound something. I have to yell out yeah. like I got to get that because I got that in me, that energy, that negative energy. Running yeah. helps. Yeah, it probably, it probably could. Helps. It that's, probably could. I know that's I one of the reasons that I can't I run. run long enough. Yeah, for real. So <laughs> I, I can only, like I start to get it out, and I'm like, I gotta quit running because I'm about to die. I and have then I, <laughs> I have three years of mm. Olympic style boxing training. I have three years of training because I had to learn how to be mad in my 30s. Actually, there's a mm. workbook, Dr. Frank Menrith and Meyer Clinic. Mm -hmm. They have an anger workbook. My therapist and I went through it because she said you don't know how to be mad. And so mm. we do have to find these expressions of our feelings, whether it's sorrow or anger, yeah. that are healthy expressions. Mm. And God is right there with yeah. us. And he's so proud of us. Yeah. That's the thing. God celebrates us like a perfect parent. He's like, yay, good job. Good job yeah. handling that. Expressing in a healthy your emotions way. that I gave you. Yeah. We're not meant to stuff it or hold it all in. That's I, what makes us fake. That reminded me, Lewis, of what, what you said. There was a uh, Mr. Rogers movie that came mm -hmm. out a few years ago. Man, that movie. I love that. That's movie. one of my favorite Which movies. Which one is it? Is it it's called? the like the it's a Mr. Rogers. I don't know what it's called, it was but it was Tom about Hanks. his life. It was Tom Hanks. Yeah, Tom Hanks. Oh, it's a biopic about. Okay. Man, it's a great. It is one of the best. You ought to see it. It is. But there's one good. scene where the guy, whatever his name was, not Mr. Rogers, but he was just he he, he was handling all the stress in that in a certain way, and Mr. Rogers just looked at him and said, "You you just seem really angry, or, or anger is how you process that." <laughs> and I think yeah, some people. No matter you know what they're going through, it ultimately you know can go to anger. Mm -hmm. For other people, it can go to other different reactions. Yeah. But we each have our our thing. We right? do. Yeah. And yeah. my husband and I, you know, Marvel fans. Mm. For the longest time, we I called him Hulk, and he called me Black Widow because mm. what's your secret? I'm always angry. That was my husband. Mm. You know? So so we we do have a few minutes left. But in honoring you, that's such if, a healthy discussion, though. If I there's something that. that you want to yeah. share that you haven't shared yet, mm -hmm. like we definitely want to give you ample time yeah. to do that. Maybe about your upcoming workshop. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes. Coming up um, next month with the Christian working woman retreat. I'm going to be teaching at a workshop. This is April 14th and 15th on the 15th. I'll be teaching on designing your life of joy. And this is using tiny habits, which is one of the methods that we teach in behavior design out of Stanford. And a method is a way of designing for desired behaviors. And so I'm going to be sharing some of my favorite tiny habits for designing a life of joy, including getting outside. Mm -hmm. Even if you just go outside for one moment, for just a couple of moments outside, just look up and marvel at the work of mm -hmm. God. That's a mm -hmm. way to sow seeds of joy into your journey. Also, uh, 
how to be happy, how to show people that you appreciate them and value them. So I'm going to be doing a workshop and also God's definition of success, because it's not our definition of success. If we could scale down our definition of success, we would live with a lot more joy. For example, my definition of success is Mm. that I love God. I love people Mm -hmm. and that's it. I'm done. And so with my kids, my definition of success for parenting is that my kids know how to have fun and they're faithful. I'm Mm. done. I'm a success at the end of the day. And so teaching God's definition of success, which is loving the Lord with heart, soul, mind, and strength. We all have the same call. I do broadcasting. I teach um, behavior design, but we have the same call. Love the Lord, heart, soul, mind, Mm -hmm. and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And that's God's definition of success and keeping it simple. So that's coming up next month with Christian Working Woman Retreat. And then I've got a spiritual warfare conference that's coming up the last Friday of this month. It's what every Christian needs to know about spiritual warfare. And you can find information about these on my website at juniefelix.com. Cool. We'll make sure we put some links to this video today. I mean, not video, this podcast. We used to do video every week. We had a camera set up and stuff, and it's like, man, that's too much. Well, we're on YouTube, too. It's just not a a video. And, of course, please do read the book and leave me a review. (laughs) That's something that I I really appreciate, my publisher, too. Yeah, amen, amen. So real quick, since you just said the Hulk and Black Widow, who's Mm -hmm. your favorite Marvel character? Well, it's Iron Man. Okay. And Dave. And Riri Williams. Yeah. And she's Ironheart. But they messed up her backstory, so I don't know what they're gonna do. Uh, you know? Okay. So she was a protege of Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't, I don't know that much about it. But my favorite <laughs> Marvel character is Nightcrawler. Oh, really? Now nah, he's scary. <laughs> he's a Christian. I don't even know who that is. <laughs> he's scary. That's all right. He's cool, man. Yeah, he's cool. He is cool. I like though. him because right. nobody, nobody. All right, would so ever you say, like the X Men? I like the X Men. Mm-hmm, yeah, there you go. I like the X Men. Yeah. So, all right. Well, man, Sam. Last word, man. It's been a great. Great conversation. I, I'm 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 a processor, so I'm gonna be you know editing this together and thinking about it. And I just really though appreciate your perspective about the tiny things about oh yes the being integrated and being willing to be your true self, right? Yes. And allowing time for yourself, and that stands out to me in our day and age, especially. I, I think of a valley, you know, or yeah, a valley and you have a m- mountain here and maybe a mountain on the other side. Uh, and sometimes you just have to go through that. Yes. The, mm-hmm. the ravine or the valley, the dark place. The way out is through. Yeah. And yeah. You, you can pretend all you want that you don't have to go through it or sidestep your way around it. Mm-hmm. But if you want to make any progress in life, you really do just need to go through it. And I think in our day and age, it's so easy and we're so just prone to say, well, no, I can find a way around it. I can go to another mountain. I, I can be another kind of mountain, be in another kind of place. It's like, no, God has placed you right there. He's called you to go through this thing and you can suppress it, but you know, it won't work. You just need to go through it. And there's another mountain on the other side. Yeah. And keep it simple. That's what we love to teach. Simplicity changes behavior. And so break the aspiration that you have down to its tiniest form. Mm -hmm. And then when you accomplish that tiny form, say you want to memorize more scripture, memorize Mm -hmm. who you are in Christ. That's a good one. You know, you know, pick a scripture like first Thessalonians five, 16, it says rejoice always is two words and then celebrate. Yes. I'm the Mm -hmm. type of person who memorizes scripture, you know, and then when you get rejoice always down, just move on to verse 17, pray without ceasing. Yes. So I'm memorizing scripture. So you're, you're re you're recoding your mind into the type of person that God designed you to be. Yeah. And you don't have to keep, don't go big. That's a, yeah, that's, yeah. that's a way to fail. Keep it tiny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And remember each keystroke in a line of code adds up into mm-hmm. the grand design mm-hmm. of your life. Mm-hmm. We're made in the image of God with such power mm-hmm. to transform our lives and communities and the lives of people around us. So we don't need to hold back. Man, so good. well, that's good. That's a good last word. So thank you, my sister June for being here, man. We just um hope you guys enjoyed this episode if you like this episode, you can let us know at bumperstickerfaith at gmail.com. We're on Facebook and Instagram now, too. Yeah, that's good. Thanks to Sam. And uh, yeah. and we hope you have a good week. Share this with people you know if it had any value, which we know it does. And we'll see you next time. Don't go stepping in no BS. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>